All right, let's go on. Here's a diagrammatic summary of the entire process. We take our protein of interest and then inject it into a mouse. The mouse develops antibodies against it. We then harvest the B cells that have created those antibodies from the spleen of the mouse and throw them into a test tube in which myeloma cells have also been thrown. We stir them around in polyethylene glycol. They fuse together and become these sort of immortal, unstoppable B cells that don't die like normal cells. Those are called hybridomas. We then screen them to find which cells are specific to the antibodies that we have in question. And once we've found those and isolated them, we can then grow them and have them reproduce in culture and then use them as needed indefinitely. As it turns out, there are two different kinds of ELISAs, an indirect ELISA and a direct or sandwich ELISA, which is the one that I just described. Now, in contrast with a sandwich ELISA, an indirect ELISA can be used to quantify the amount of a protein you have in solution if the protein you're looking for happens to be an antibody. Isn't that weird? Now, the sandwich ELISA, of course, can be used to quantify any kind of protein imaginable. The two processes are summarized diagrammatically in these figures. In an indirect ELISA, what you do is instead of coating the bottom of your well with antibodies, you coat them with antigens that are specific, of course, to the antibodies that you're trying to quantify. You then add your protein, which for an indirect ELISA has to be an antibody itself. That antibody will get stuck to the antigen at the bottom. You then wash the well out to remove any excess antibodies or excess junk. And then you add an additional antibody that is also specific to this blue colored antibody and has been in turn labeled with an enzyme shown here as capital letter E. You wash out all of the excess floating around garbage and then you add your substrate S, which makes it change color. You measure the degree of color change, and that allows you to quantify the amount of your protein, which in this specific case is an antibody itself, colorized here in blue. The indirect ELISA, once again, is only good for measuring proteins if the protein you're trying to measure is an antibody itself. A sandwich ELISA, which I've already described, is summarized in this diagram here, and it can be used to quantify any protein, including antibodies. I now want to read two paragraphs from page 82 of our text, starting with the words we will consider. I love reading strategic paragraphs from our book because this is one of my favorite textbooks in the chemistry world. In this particular paragraph it says, we will consider two among the several types of ELISA. The indirect ELISA is used to detect the presence of antibody and is the basis of the test for HIV infection. The HIV test detects the presence of antibodies that recognize viral core proteins, the antigen. Purified viral core proteins are absorbed to the bottom of a well. Antibodies from the person being tested are then added to the coated well. Only someone infected with HIV will have antibodies that bind to the antigen. Finally, enzyme-linked antibodies to human antibodies are allowed to react in the well, and unbound antibodies are removed by washing. Substrate is then applied. An enzyme reaction suggests that the enzyme-linked antibodies were bound to human antibodies, which in turn implies that the patient has antibodies to the viral antigen. I'll now teach you about a different technique called Western blotting. Western blotting, which is also called immunoblotting, is another way of identifying proteins. Now, you can't quantify them using Western blotting as you can with ELISA. Western blotting has the advantage of being usable with more complex impure mixtures than ELISA. Here's how it works. We first run our complex mixture through SDS page. We then transfer our proteins to a polymer sheet and we then add an antibody that has been attached to an enzyme E, that's a fluorescence enzyme. We stir that in a solution, and that antibody that is specific to the protein we care about attaches to that protein right here on the polymer sheet. We then remove the sheet, add a substrate S which attaches to that enzyme and causes it to glow. The presence of that glow tells us that that protein that is specific for that antibody is actually present. Unfortunately, this process does not allow for extremely good quantification of the protein, but only allows us to determine yes or no whether the protein is there. Now, just in case you're interested, Western blotting happens to be used to test for hepatitis C infections. So up to this point in this chapter, I've talked about how to uh, purify proteins. I've talked about how to determine if your purification process is working. And I've also uh, talked to you about how we can use a lysis to measure the amounts of protein or Western blotting to determine whether or not a certain protein is there, yes or no. After going through all of that rigmarole, let's pretend that we've actually come up with a really good way of identifying and measuring and purifying a protein in question. What do we do next? 
Well, what we usually want to do is determine that protein's primary structure. That is, the complete list of every single amino acid in that protein from left to right. How do we do that? Well, the first step in this process is to boil the crap out of the protein using strong acid. That hydrolyzes or breaks apart every single one of the peptide or amide bonds in that protein apart, separating out all of its individual amino acids. We can then purify those out and separate them further by using chromatography and then measure them using an amino acid analyzer. This is a machine that tells us what percentages of each of the amino acids are present in solution. For example, for this peptide whose sequence is shown right here, acid-mediated hydrolysis and amino acid analysis would reveal it to contain these amino acids here. You'll notice, of course, that glycine would be present in double the amount of the other four amino acids because it is present twice in the initial peptide. Notice then that this process only tells us which amino acids are present in the original protein and their relative amounts. It doesn't tell us their order. So because an amino acid analyzer doesn't tell us the order that the amino acids are in in the original peptide, we have to use a technique called protein sequencing. One of the simplest methods in protein sequencing is called Edmund degradation. Here's how that works. In Edmund degradation, we use a chemical called fluoresamine to chemically chew off the end terminus of the peptide and identify just the one amino acid that's present at the end terminus. After you identify that amino acid, you repeat the process for the next amino acid, identify it, and then do it for the next one, and so forth and so on. You do that until you've sequenced or come up with the list of every single amino acid in the peptide. The problem with Edmund degradation is that it's impractical and doesn't really work for proteins that are larger than about 50 amino acids in length. Instead, we break such proteins, these larger proteins, into multiple smaller individual fragments and then use Edmund degradation to sequence each of those individual fragments. We can then sort of puzzle piece them back together to determine what the overall grand protein was from whence these fragments were taken. When we fragment proteins apart, we do it by using enzymes that selectively break only one type of bond. In essence, the strategy then is to divide and conquer. Two types of such enzymes are trypsin and chymotrypsin. Trypsin selectively cleaves the amide bond on the carboxyl side of arginine and lysine only. Chymotrypsin does the same, but only for phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. So for example, if you had a peptide that had this sequence of amino acids, chymotrypsin would cleave on the carboxylic acid side of phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan and give you each of these individual pieces or fragments left over. Trypsin would do the analogous thing, except only on the carboxylic acid side of lysine and arginine, which would leave you these other fragments left over. You could then use Edmund degradation to sequence each of the individual fragments and then puzzle piece what those initial fragments must have been like or put together in the original peptide. That takes us to some cool lecture problems. I want you to give the amino acid sequence of a hexapeptide that contains the following amino acids that produces the following fragments when hydrolyzed with acid. Next question, what fragments would the peptide described in this problem give if it were treated with trypsin and with chymotrypsin? Now I'm not gonna do these problems here, but will instead invite you to think about and attempt them on your own. If you'd like to see it then, I'll post a link here to a separate video in which I do them on the board. Now I've already talked about trypsin and chymotrypsin. Turns out that there are other commonly used fragmentation enzymes. Such enzymes include those shown in this table here. If you want, you can pause the video here and read these enzymes. I'm not gonna test you guys on this in depth or anything. I just want you to be familiar or exposed to these so that you know that they exist and what they do. In case you ever work at a tech company where you're required to use some of them to help sequence uh, the primary structure of a protein. We now end with our final details. Protein's amino acid sequence, that is, its primary structure, can be a valuable source of insight into the protein's function, structure, and history. To further address this particular topic, I would like you, my students, to read points 1 through 6 from pages 86 through 87 of our text on your own. That takes us to the end of this lecture. It's been wonderful, and I hope you've had an enjoyable time. I'll see all you guys in class later on. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.